Right. So what's this about? This is about how you build digital systems of a certain scale. So everything you've done so far has been, as far as the coursework I set, quite small individual components. You've never had to think about anything big, shall we say, nothing that's had to scale up to anything close to the size of, say, a microcontroller or microprocessor or something. And um, it is quite daunting to think about building something of that scale, but actually it doesn't need to be, not necessarily. I mean, I'm not going to underestimate the size of that sort of task, but um, there are some sort of what we call design patterns or solutions to known problems which kind of help with this and, and let us sort of break things down, both in terms of time and in space. OK, what do I mean? Well, let, let's start by coming back to this. So we're talking again about state machines and I introduced uh, something called ASM charts, if you recall. And uh, this on the screen would represent a single state. So on a clock edge, our state uh, assignment or number would change and we would enter this state on the rising edge of that clock for a period of time. And uh, this this is a single state. And the way we draw it is this rectangle. Any signals asserted high will be written inside the box. Now, this is an important detail straight off the bat. If You might have forgotten this. So if a signal is low, we just don't write it. When a signal is asserted high, we write it. We don't have to write equals one. We just put the name in. And this means that if we've got lots of signals, most of which are zero most of the time, we can just not write them. If you have an active low signal, you could always write a bar across the top. Top left hand corner state name, which is just a convenient name to give it meaning to the designer. And then on the right, the state assignment, the actual number used to encode that state. All right. So this state lasts one clock cycle. So as I said, on the rising edge of the clock, we would transition to this state from that top arrow. And then for one clock cycle, we would stay there. And then by the look of it, we're off to another one on the next clock. All right. So this is a more output. And uh, therefore, the function, sorry, the output is a purely so is purely a function of state. All right. So coming back to the timing. Uh, if we look at this state diagram on the right, we've got three ABC. And during state A, the reset signal is set high during state B. The start mm -hmm. signal is set high and in state C. You've got neither set high. OK, so let's now look at this timing diagram and we see that same information. And I've added a little bit of propagation delay to add realism. So if we look at the clock at the top, we see the duration of time we're in state A. And notice that during the whole cycle, that reset signal is pulled high. OK, uh, similarly for state B from the more output start again, as soon as that right edge rises and we enter that state, the state internally gets changed. The output's just a function of that. So we see a change almost immediately in the output bar a little bit of propagation delay in here. All right. So remember, the output is just a function of state. What do we, how do we make functions? Combinational logic, mostly. Yeah, AND gates, OR gates, multiplexes, those sorts of things. All right. So that's the that's the timing. So there we see those states labeled. It's, as I say, it's really important that that's kind of clear in your mind. All right. This is where so there'll be some. So state A, whatever coding that is, it could be, I don't know, 12 or something is sat on the input of some D type flip flops. And on the rising edge of the clock, blump, it changes. That feeds into a block of logic and the output. For reset goes high. So in that state, reset is low, sorry, high. In this state, start is high. Notice that reset comes back down because it's not mentioned in here. All right, so we're not writing all of them all over the state. You'd end up with such a mess, you'd never understand it. 
So this is what's quite nice about ASM charts. And in a minute, you'll see something even nicer. OK, so these points are here for revision purposes as well. So output is asserted high at the beginning of the state. So when we enter state A, it's really important to stress this. That's this rising edge here. This is the beginning of this state and the output changes with it because it's just a function of it. Um, and as I said, if unless it's said otherwise, like in state C, we neither mention reset or start. So they're both low during state C. OK, so this is good. If you're trying to generate single pulses. Brilliant. Right. OK. Registers. Now we make these are subtly different to what we've just looked at. This is what it might look like. It's got an output. In this case, it's an 8-bit register. And what is a register? Well, if you've ever written any assembly language, you'll, you might recognize the, the word register. It's an integer that once you set it, it remembers its value. OK, if you've used the C programming language or C++, which you should all have if you've come through the first year, then you'll recognize that maybe um, for example, a uh, unsigned char, right, would be an 8-bit register. So you, you set its value and then it remembers that value. You don't have to keep telling it what to be. You just in one line, boom, set X to 5 and then that's it. You can set and forget. All right. So there's an equivalent in digital electronics. And uh, in VHDL, inside a process block, we meet variables. OK, so this would be. A register opposite and it's got an input called D it's an 8-bit input we've got a reset we've got a clock and interestingly we've got this load pin this is the key to understanding registers is this load pin all right if this load is not high it isn't going to do anything it in fact it gates out the clock quite often so we can put data on here and we can clock it and it won't it'll ignore the inputs unless load is high. All right. So let's look at them. So clock is standard logic, single input bit, load, single input bit, reset the same. D is an 8-bit input in this case and Q is an 8-bit output. And we note in and out. All right. So that's the entity and that's what it looks like. Now let's look at the architecture. So for the same entity, this is its architecture. Now, the box in yellow is where I want you to sort of focus your attention, which is why, of course, I've drawn a box in yellow. So, again, if we've got a rising edge of a clock. And if the load equals to one, then this signal here I call latched is equal to the input D. All right. And as I don't specify what latch should be for all the other cases, such as when load equals zero, then we've got an implicit latch there. So it sets it and remembers it. OK, so looking through the whole thing, the output it just is set to latched. Latched is an internal signal. I've put this after 10 nanoseconds purely to make my simulations look a bit more realistic and to check my timing. Ignore that. OK, so the output Q is just assigned to latch. So they've, they've wired up. And then this process block is sensitive to clock and reset. Well, if reset goes low, latch gets set to zero. That's your asynchronous reset. You've got to have one of those for power on. Um, other, if you're not resetting the device, then on a rising edge, if and only if load equals one, then we latch the value on the input. OK, um, so if load is zero, it just remembers whatever it was before. So in other words, it remembers the value. Um, let's look at some timing of this and hopefully it'll make more sense. Uh, oh, sorry. Before we do, if you if you write this code. And uh, you synthesize it, and build it, and synthesize it in Quartus and actually have a look and see what it's used. This is what you see. And actually hardly anything's changed. That's because what I've just described in VHDL is a standard component called a register. All right, it's got a D input, it's got a clock, it's got this, my, I've called it load, but they call it enable, clock enable. All right, and 
we've got the reset here and the output. So I've not I, I've kind of reinvented something that's already in the library. And so you probably would use the part that's in the library, not not the one I've written. OK, so that's that's that. Um, if we go in a little level deeper and have a look and see what Quartus has used, you'll see that this eight bit input and eight bit output. What is it? Well, it's just eight latches or eight registers, I should say. Eight one bit registers. All with a D input, a clock and an enable. This is my load. Right. When that's high, then this input gets basically copied to the internal register and therefore the output. If it's low, the internal value is held and remembered and the output is latched and you can do what you like with the inputs and the clocks in. It's, they're just ignored. All right. Now, these exist, as I understand it, in the macro cells of the FPGA. So they're kind of, a, if you like, a low level component that they come with the FPGA anyway. Uh, and when you do a build, you might have seen what well, we will have seen this. You might see this thing here, total registers. So for this code, I made this the only ent entity and I built it. And indeed, it's used eight registers and they mean one bit registers. These things which which are in there in the macro cells. So let's look at the timing. This is where things differ slightly to what you saw just now. So here's the register that I've designed clock, load, asynchronous reset and data. Let's have a look. So here's my data down here. Here's the rising edge. We've entered. Let's say we've entered state A. I want to set my register to 99. OK, so I put 99 on. The input and I set load high. So this is the state A here. So I've entered this this initial state A. And semantically, I'm saying set the register to 99. So I put 99 on here. Here and I set load high, but the output does not change immediately. Because this won't change until the rising edge of the of, of the next state. So it's this edge here. That will cause the output to change and you can see it 99 is here look this is the next state state b right and that's when you see 99 so it's delayed one clock cycle so another way of looking at this is that whatever value you put on here if you set load high what you're saying is what's the next state of this output what's it going to be in the, on the next clock edge all right um, so data must be stable before the clock edge. Load must be stable before the clock edge. Uh, these are D-type flip flops, carefully designed to have no hold time, just set up time. So having set up what I want the output to be, we then have to wait for the next clock edge for it to change. All right. So there is a delay. So this is how you'd write it on an ASM chart. This was the slide I thought I was going to see. I've swapped them around. I'm regretting it now. OK, so state A here, we would write. Right. OK, let's take this one. This is what we would do. We would set the data input to 99. We'd set load to one. Then when we go to on the next clock edge, we go to this state B. And that's when we see the uh, output of that register change. Now. That's the timing signals. That's what we've got here, DAT and load. Notice that. When we set, in fact, I don't even need that equals there. I could just write load. That's what we actually do. Way we write it, if we're thinking and trying to design things and we want to avoid clutter, I would write it like this output. That's uh, this one here. That's this signal at the bottom. Will be assigned to 99. This is a register transfer. Output is a register and we're going to set it to 99. So that does not change it in state A. That's in this one. Right? That's when you'll actually see it in state B, as you can see here. So again, in state A, we set things up 
And then on the next clock edge, with a little bit of propagation delay, we see the output change to 99. Notice that load then goes low. And doesn't matter what you do with the clock in the inputs, the output stays at 99. So this is effectively saying let output equal 99 in C. But the change doesn't happen until the next clock cycle. All right. But the nice thing is you set it and you forget it. Now, load is what we call a control signal. That's this load here. So when we decide to write to a register, we have to assert that control signal high. Um, this register has an input called DAT, right? And that's either from a data bus or it could be from another register or it could be from an analog to digital converter, something like that. So that will be the data coming into the register and the control signal to make it store it is load. All right, so loads the control and that is data that is coming in and being stored. Right. So let's have a look at the timing of that again. Um, here's another example. So in state A, it's a normal melee output. Sorry, more output. What am I saying? It's a normal more output reset. So during state A, we see this go high. For the full duration of that state. This one's different. That's what this arrow is saying. This is a register transfer. We're saying set the register start to one. That won't actually occur until the end of this state or the beginning of the next. All right. All right which is here. So notice we're in state A. The reset changes with it. We're in state B here. We're setting the register to up to change, but it hasn't changed yet. Then when we enter the next state C, we see it and we see it latch. All right. So this is what's called a register transfer. And um, once we set it, we don't have to hold it. We don't have to remember to do it. All we've got to do is put the data on the input, pulse the load pin from one, one state, which is happening in here, and it latches it and remembers it. And we can go off and think about something else. OK, and that's kind of like variables in, in programming. So this is the idea of set and forget. Not completely forget, but, you know, you don't have to keep asserting control signals. Um, in this form, this more abstracted form, we're not showing the timing signals on purpose. We want to sort of think about the signals and the registers, or particularly the registers. I want to set this register to this, I want to, as you'll see later. It helps us think it through. We can then convert it into actual signals that we would set and reset very, very easily. OK, and this is kind of where it goes. Right. So I mentioned um, these registers having inputs and outputs yeah, and control signals. And at a higher level, systems are partitioned in this way. So this is controller data path. Now, control signals are going horizontally in this diagram and the data is going vertically like this. So this is some some system and uh, it could just be a single register it could be a collection of registers it could be registers and multiplexers as you'll see um, more commonly yeah or some combinational logic with a set of inputs and a set of outputs and you might even have feedback coming around and all that sort of thing now all the control signals that that that, that activate the different registers are controlled separately in this device called the controller so it's generating control signals to switch on and off the bits in here in the right sequence. And then you might get results from that coming back, which would be the status signals. For example, you might have two registers feeding into an adder circuit and you might get an overflow or you might get a carry. So that's the status signal coming back to the controller. All right. So we've partitioned now our bespoke controller that's home designed you know specific to your actual um if you like solution and then we've got this logic over here and this tends to be made of registers multiplexers other reusable components it could be blocks of ram and ram interfaces 
it, it could be all sorts of things. But the sequencing of all that stuff is separated out into one or more state machines. All right. So this is what I'm suggesting now. We call this, as I say, the data path. And this is the controller. And note that everything is reset, at power on, and they all share the same clock. All right. OK, so this pattern is very commonly used. So much so it's in most books and um, it is actually used. And it helps us stay sane when we're trying to think through big systems. So kind of where this kind of goes is that we start to design uh, digital systems in a similar way to the way we might think through software in terms of sequences. The big difference with VHDL and, and Verilog is that we've got the option to do stuff in parallel. Yeah, we can have we can add four numbers, as you'll see in a minute, by doing one after the other. Or we could have four adder circuits, doing them all together. Uh, I, the choice is yours. You just need to sequence it from here and pl place down the logic over here. And you can probably guess where this is leading. Um, one of the places this could lead, I mean, it's a, probably a bit late in the day to be saying this, and I'm not suggesting you rip up your your designs and change them now. But if we were talking about your coursework, for example, what have you got? You've got Hall effect inputs, you've got a camera and some switches coming in here. And the output is the pulse width modulator and the speaker. And you might have some feedback as well. Um, but you could partition this all right, into uh, one or more state machines over here, issuing control signals, switching on different bits at different times, and we sense back what's going on from here. Right. So inside this, you would probably have lots of registers and we'd be transferring information between them, routing it between different registers, storing intermediate results like you would with variables in a language. Yeah. So, for example, you might feed the Hall effects into a timer circuit which estimates the speed. You might then store that speed in a register at the same time. Based on the previous speed, you might be adjusting the pulse width modulation to try and you know, make the motors go faster or slower. Um, you can do things sequentially like a microprocessor or you can do them in parallel. Uh, we're not going to pick on such a complex example because that's non-trivial. Right? Um, we're going to look at a much simpler one in a minute to, to make that point. I suspect some of you by now are scratching your head and wondering what's this all about. Um, it is an important subject, though, so don't give up on it. Right. OK, no questions so far. So note this here, tray between space and speed. Yeah, we can parallel up tasks. You know, we can have several pulse width modulator controllers or we could have just one and share it. Um, not a great design, I suggest. Or, but when you get bigger arithmetic units like adders and multipliers, they take a lot of space. So sometimes it's good to sequence things through them, taking a turn, or sometimes you just duplicate them out, fill up more logic and the routing between them and do stuff in parallel. You can control it. It's your call. And uh, this is often the art of the design. So let's look at one of these examples. And it's the textbook example that nearly everybody gives um, and it, because it is such a good one. Now, adder circuits, I'm not saying how big these signals are, all right? These could be one bit, or these could be 32 bit, or anything in between. They are n bit signals. Now, I'm not thinking about overflows right now. I'm not going to worry about that. Let's look at what this costs. If I write this in behavioral VHDL, in other words, the most abstracted form, it doesn't have to be in a process block, I would add. Um, then uh, we would go A plus B plus C plus D. Now these are input signals and this is an output signal. All right. Um, who knows actually what the synthesis engine will do? I don't know. Um, you can dig in and have a look. But something it might do is what we see here. Uh, it might do it slightly differently. It might add A to B, C to D and then add the results. But this is the fully, this, this, is, this is the sort of cascaded one. So we add A to B, there's the result, that's added to C, 
there's the result and that's added to D and that's the final thing. And there's no clock here. So this happens as fast as it can. You get this ripple delay going through it. Right, so 8 bit adder, 8 bit adder, 8 bit adder or 32 bit adder. Now these take space, all right? And so does this and so does this. So we are calculating as much in parallel as we can um, by throwing in extra adders. I would actually add A to B and C to D and then take the two results and add those right, to reduce the ripple error. But hey, this was the one I found in the textbook. And uh, who am I to argue? So this is what we call a parallel implementation. All right, we just apply the signals, pure combinational logic, output. And if there was no such thing as propagation delay, this would give you an instant result. Yeah, everyone get that? Um, so that's that's the parallel form. And we when we do this sort of thing, y is a plus b plus c plus d, you know, you might switch, you know, do data type conversions, switch to unsigned or, in, or or integer, and just trust the tools and just say, go for it. Now, when you're trying to get the ideas right, when you're trying to make something work, brilliant. That's the right thing to do. Absolutely. Because in simulation, this takes zero time anyway. When you're testing, if you like, your top level design and your thoughts, how you actually get it to synthesize in the end probably won't be with a statement like this. All right. Unless you're happy to just take the hit. Or trust the tools. Um, you might want to go into the optimization phase and start drilling down and making this more efficient or space compact, depending on what you need. But for modeling behavioral stuff and just getting stuff working. Fantastic. Right. What could be simpler than writing a statement like that? OK, so that's your fully parallel. Let's now look at the other end of the spectrum where we only use one adder to add all four up. So we do A plus B, we take the result and on the next clock cycle, we'll do the result of that plus C. Then on the next clock cycle, we'll take the result of that and feed it into the same adder again like this. OK, now look at this carefully. One adder. Right. And one register. The register holds the last result. It's a holding area for the current sum, what we call an accumulator in, in this particular example. So if we take A and B and we route those through to this adder. We get A plus B stored in this variable or this register. All right. And once we set it, we've got it. All right, so it's got its enable pin, it's got its clock, it's got its reset, it's got its input, and there's its output. All right, so this is a multiplexer, right? So when this is zero, the top line is routed through, and when it's a one, the bottom line is routed through. All right, really important. Same with this one, with, with the control signal S1, when it's zero, top line, one, bottom line. And same for S2, another control line. So we've actually got four control lines, S0, S1, S2. That routes the signals through to the summing circuit. And we've got the enable pin here or load pin for storing it in a register. So the sequence will be take A and B, add them, store them in a register. That's then fed back into here. Add that to C. Feed that back round and then add that to D. Let's let's see that. So the register transfer level design, if you like, is here or the register operations. Y is assigned to A plus B. So let's get the first sum out of the way. So that's this one. Add this one. Then we say that Y equals Y plus C. So we take the Y output through here into the adder and then we route C through. Store it. That's what this arrow means. And then we do y equals y plus d. So again, current result stuffed in here through to the adder and d comes through here. Then you work out the control signals for those. Oh, by the way, and on the next clock cycle, I don't. Yeah. It, then you've got the, res the result in in the output, because remember, a register needs it isn't set until the end of the state. 
So in the first case, why is a plus b? Well, we want a and we want b. So we set s0 to 1. Yeah. And we set s1 to 0 to get b through. s0 to 1, s1 to 0, s2, we don't care. And we need to enable the register so that on the next clock cycle, it will be stored and fed back into here. Let's simplify it. Much nicer. Remember, more outputs. Yeah, these are the signals that are asserted high. The others we can assume to be low. So S0 and EN. S0, EN. So S0 is a 1, bringing A through. S1 is a 0, bringing B through. Who cares about S2? So we'll leave it at 0. On the next one, y equals y plus c. Well, when we fed y back through this multiplexer, this has to be zero, so s0 does not appear. So now it's all down to these two. Um, so we have s1 and the enable. Hang on a minute, let's get that right. That's right, s2 is zero, so we don't list it. So that c comes through here. Y is fed through here, so that's Y equals Y itself plus C. Next clock cycle, that will be latched here and come back round. And then finally, we set S1 and S2 high, so that's uh, this one and this one. So we're routing D through to the adder, and we've got Y through to the other side of the adder. And that means on the next clock, Y will be Y plus D. So if you look at that, it's a bit like assembly language, right? Or microcode, as it's sometimes called. So this is the fully sequential version. And let's get something straight. Before, I'm going to say it later. I'm going to say it now. Don't go redesigning microprocessors. If you find yourself doing everything sequentially, use a microcontroller. They're very cheap. Right? Um, if you're using an FPGA, you're doing that because you need parallel execution. Probably they're much more expensive than microcontrollers and take a lot more time to design. But it's that freedom to switch between sequential or combined sequential and parallel execution that is so fantastic in these things. So there you go. So that that is the these are the signal sequences. These are the register transfers. These are much easier to understand. But, but in reality, we, we do them this way. And note the creative use of multiplexers all over the place. Now, bear in mind, A, B, C and D um, and Y could be one bit signals or they could be 32 bit signals. All we need are bigger multiplexers and bigger adders and bigger registers. The control signals are the same. Right. And actually, Phil Colbhouse was saying to me that what you often do is or you certainly used to do was to start with one bit and test it all out and then increase it. Let's come back to this example then, this sequential adder. Remember, what are we achieving here? We're only using up one adder circuit. This would be particularly relevant if we were multiplying, I would add, or particularly even more so dividing, because they get big, and you've only got so many of those hardware. You can do soft multipliers, but um, they're, precious resource. So there was my register transfer state machine, if you like, transferring one register well, results into registers. Right. Those were the actual signals written as more machine outputs, um, sequencing the whole thing, right? Sequencing routing signals through the circuit and background, right, to get the result we want. OK, so it's kind of like programming. What does it look like? Well, um, there's the state transition logic. Which is the usual state machine thing, and all this state is goes A, B, C, D, right? So there's nothing to show there. State A goes to state B, state B goes to state D, right? So we do A plus B, result plus C, result plus D, another, another state, and we've got the answer. Right, so this is the output part. Remember with, with uh, more machines, we can split 
into two process blocks, one for next state and one for output. And it's a good practice to do that. And there's a really nice pattern you've got. Let me wind back, actually. Remember um, this. OK, so state A, assert these. State B, assert these. State C, assert these. Assume the others to be zero. All right. How do we do that? Well, at the beginning of our process block, we set them all to zero. Right. So set everything to zero and their signals note. Yeah. And then we consider the state where we're in A, we set S0 and EN. When we're in B, we set S1 and EN. When we're in C, these two. When in D, well, we're done, right? That's when we sort of collect the result. So notice that here we only set the signals um, that are ones. So set everything to zero. Now, it doesn't matter that we do it twice because we're in a process block. So look, S0, it says its default is zero. But if we're in state A, it gets set to one. It's the last one that wins. Right. There's no transition. This all takes zero time. In other words, S0 gets set to one. Right? That's what it means. If, if this is the second one, that's the, it remembers the second one. It takes that as the and it's at the end of the process block. It happens. So. This is a really nice pattern, right? If you can pick up the habit of doing this. Set everything to naught. And then it, when you're looking at what state you're in, just set the outputs to go to one and it keeps it clean and compact easy to follow, easy to debug, and it matches this perfectly, which is a good thing. We can see what we're doing. Sorry, there it is again. So there you go. Uh, so you start with the register transfers, drill down to the signals, build the, the state logic, and that's your control. All right. This over here is your data path, right? You've got your inputs coming in, your output coming out, and there's your control lines. And I've written them the other way around now. I've got data path coming in horizontally, and I've got control lines coming in vertically, right? But they're separate. All right, so let's look at it. Um, oh, whoa, 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 steady. So this was the actual design that I did, because I've built this and I've put it on the module site. You might not have noticed, but it's there. All right, uh, so this is the actual timing result. and no kidding, I built this one for this lecture following the exact principles I've described, and it all worked first time, which is not common with VHDL. <laughs> state A, state B, state C, state D in A. OK, so we uh, this is our output Y. You can see the intermediate results on this register. So the inputs are 5, 3, 10 and 2, and I want to add them all up. So five plus three is what's presented at the beginning. All right. And uh, I'm not showing you the load signal, am I? No, no, we're just seeing the, 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 the different states as we go through. So in state A, we got is when we see all the, out, the inputs presented uh, and the next state, we see the, the, the result in the register, which is eight, five plus three. Then it's eight plus ten. And then it's 10 plus 2, which sorry, talking rubbish, 18 plus 2, which is 20. Right. So in the fourth state, D, we actually see a result. And if you do nothing more, then it just stays there. All right. So that, that that's it. So notice these intermediate results. Because it's sequential. This is what it looks like in quarters. OK, so. Again, I've separated them. I've just got in here. All we've got is a single adder and some multiplexers. We've got data coming in. We've got data going out. And then I've got a whole load of, well, obviously we've got the clock and the reset, right? But we've got enable S0, S1 and S2. They're my control lines. And they are fed by the controller. Right. This one doesn't produce any results that I can feed back to the controller. It's a bit simpler than that. Anyway, let's have a look at the data path. This is what we've actually got. It looks scary, but it's just that diagram I did just now. So that's the adder, that's the register, and these are the multiplexers routing the signals into the adder. 
note the output fed back through this multiplexer here. And these multiplexers, these bus mucks, is just part of the standard library. To be honest, there's an adder in there as well, but it's a bit more complicated than mine. And I want to keep it simple. And there'll be registers in there as well. But again, I wanted to actually show you what it, you know, what it is and how it's made. I've made mine generic as well, notice. So I can change the number of bits. At the moment, I'm on an 8-bit signal, but I could just change these numbers and I could go up to 32-bit. And the design would stay the same. It would take up more space. Uh, but uh, I would just need to change my signals. And I've now got a 32-bit system. All right. So that is just that, that thing there. All right. Mux, 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 sum, register feedback exactly the same thing so that that you know it's a way to keeping control of things as they get complex partitioning things off um, and don't think it's just one data path and one controller components can be built like this and then they become part of the data path or part of the controller you know All right so that's your data path um, so moving on so those multiplexers, if you, all right, let's wind back a bit, sorry. If you look at these, there's quite a bit of routing going on through this thing. And these, you know, these are 32-bit lines. They're going to start taking up space. So let's look at something where we don't have particularly fast or tight real-time deadlines. And this is this idea that we've got an analog to digital converter here, which takes an analog input and converts it to, I'm going to say, an 8-bit number. And this is a digital to analog converter, which takes an 8-bit number and converts it to a voltage. And um, I want to interface this to a microcontroller. I might have a soft core, which is a VHDL or Verilog microprocessor or microcontroller. And you can get those. Plenty of them. Right. So what I'd like to do, because this could be busy doing something, I want to, when I get analog to digital conversion completed I want to store it in this register uh, when I've got a valid result and I'm ready to write it out I want to store it in this register and then convert it all right so we have this shared data line here now note that this one is writing to these lines these parallel wires the CPU has bidirectional we'll come to that but this one's just an input Right now, inputs are high impedance anyway. Um, they just sense; they don't cause bus collisions. They're fine. But this, this output of this thing, uh, we've got to be careful because if the microprocessor is writing to these wires, we mustn't write to them with this one. Okay. So this thing needs to be capable of going into a high impedance state. This output needs to disappear, like it isn't connected. All right. So a slight modification on this register would be an output enable. So that's what I've added now. I've just tweaked my register a bit and I've added this output enable so that I can make the output tri-state. All right, so there we go, another input. And Q is still just type out and it's standard logic vector. We've got separate inputs, so we've got data as an input and q as an output they are distinct they're not connected together because this is coming from another component the output can go into the z state mm. it, when the output enable pin is low and yeah okay that's saying the same thing okay let's have a look at the logic for this it's just a minor modification really um, again, notice that the output Q is asserted to this latched signal, this one here. Um, when the output enable is one, otherwise it's high impedance. Now, this is asynchronous uh, because the thing that's driving it is synchronous. OK, I checked this with Phil as well, and he agrees. So the output enable takes immediate effect. But bear in mind that you drive it from a synchronous output, some, some other device in the system that's clocked. So in other words, output enable just controls whether the queue is, as before, connected to latch or high impedance. That's it. That's the only difference. So what I've now got is a register 
that we can electronically disconnect from, from some shared data lines or a bus. Now, what if we need bi-directional communication? This register here is now bi-directional. We might want to take the numbers in here and apply them to this adder or this one. Or we might want to write results back into them. Now, to do that, we need bi-directional ports. So if you think of um, a microcontroller, for example, we often have these things called ports that, or GPIOs. And uh, they can either be configured as outputs or input at one, at one time or another. OK, now the motivation for doing all of this is because remember with this this um, adding thing that we were doing earlier, but we've got one adder here. And I might want to add these two, the, the values stored in these two things. And um, I don't need to do it particularly quickly. So I don't mind doing things in sequence like a microprocessor does it. Again, let me repeat. I'm not advocating that you do everything with a bus. and Everything is sequence. If you do that, you might as well use a microcontroller. But there's always a mixture of models, if you like. Yes, we've got one set of parallel wires that we have to route, so that's a bit easier. We just need to tap off them at various points. And we have some control lines as well. Not all of them are shown here. Right. I mean, somehow we need this bi-directional support. So we need to be either right to this bus or read from it. OK, how does that work? The outputs change now to instead of out to in out. OK. And VHDL is very good at sorting this out for you. So you've not seen in out before. So it's it's either an input or an output. It can't be both at the same time. Uh, uh, actually, da, 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 da. you can read it while you're writing it, I think. Um, but, you know, you usually think of it as an input or an output. You think of this having a direction. So we've got the usual clock, the usual load, the asynchronous reset and the output enable. And now instead of calling it in or Q, I've brought them together into one. I've called it data bus and it's type in out. All right. And you'll see how it works. It's actually really nice. So that's my big change here. And here it is. Now, look at this a bit carefully. Um, this. All right. So data bus is in our entity. Um, when the output enable is a one, then data bus is assigned to the latch signal as it was before. Otherwise, it's high impedance. All right. So when the output is not enabled, it's just said. If we get a rising edge on the clock and load equals one. Then we also treat this as an input. All right. So it's not good to make load one and output enable one at the same time. Um, thinking of thinking on my feet here, I think it will work. But you question, what is it you're trying to do here? You're trying to read your own output. So we'll assume for now that when output enable equals low. Right. The output's high impedance. We might load a value into this into this register. So we set that to one. And again, we're using the same pins and output and input and it'll sort it out for you because by setting it to high impedance um, you're effectively making it the win input okay so by setting oe to zero you're making this thing an in by setting it to one you're making it an out okay and then latch just equals the input right so let's have a look at the uh the timing for this We reset it. The output enable is low. So the output of the register, well, it won't be you won't be driving anything. So at this point, we just got high impedance on the data bus. Now, what's happening here is that uh, something has put this on the data bus. All right. Could be the micro microprocessor, could be another register. Could be analog to digital converter, could be anything. 
has has written to the data bus. OK, and that's the value on the bus. Now, I I'll, I'll emphasize that this device has not done that. And we're now going to pull in this state. Lots of propagation delay here. Oops. Uh, I've pulled the load signal high. So that is internally latched into the register. OK, so now rising edge bump at this point here inside the register, we've now got this thing latched AA. So load goes down. And now over here, the output enable of my register is pulled high and it's now driving the bus with AA because that's what's stored inside it. OK. So we've read in this cycle here. So something else has written this and we read it in. And here we're writing it back out again. OK, we've got some little labels for you to look at afterwards. Right, this is where it comes together. So I think we'll do this bit and then see if there's any questions. So have a look at this design. We're back to where we were just now. I want to do the following operation R0 equals R0 plus R1. So I've loaded some numbers into these registers. Right, as you would do as a C compiler might produce this in assembly language uh, or you might write it or you may write microcode. Which is what this is. So R0 whatever, is to be equal to itself plus what's ever in here. There's a common bus. We've got an adder. And we've got another register here called the accumulator. It's just a register. OK, so here's the sequence. Here's the microcode or the register transfers. I want accumulator to equal R0. So I take R0 and I want to copy in here. Then I want to take accumulator itself. And add on R1, the value in here. And then I want to store the result back in R0. OK. Does that make sense? Everyone all right with that? So again, accumulator equals R0 to begin with. Then we add on R1 to the accumulator because it's got feedback. Right? And then we store it back in here again. And that's therefore we've achieved this instruction. Right? This this operation. Let's look at the signals. So I've written the signals here. I've got the loads and the output enables for register naught, register one and the accumulator. So LD means load, OE means output enable. Oh, we've got S naught as well. Let's look at it. So this is the sort of register transfer um, level design, if you like, or register operations. Now we need to convert that to timing signals. And remember, we only write the ones that are high. So output enable of R naught would take the whatever's in this register and push it onto this data bus. An LDA will load whatever's on here and store it here on the next clock cycle. S0 is zero by default, so the top one, that's this bus, comes through into the accumulator. So that's state A. Note the bold lines. All right, we've output enabled R0. We've routed it through the mux to the input of the accumulator with pull load high and in state b this signal here and here they're the same thing will be uh, valid so let's look at state b take the output of the accumulator okay which is connected to here so what have we got? We've got OER1. So now we're putting R1 onto the bus. And that's connected to this adder. The output of the accumulator is on the other input of, of the adder. So this is accumulator equals itself plus R1. All right. S0 is set to 1. So we take this bottom path and feed it into here. So that's going to be the next state of, of, of ACC, of the accumulator. So that is state B. 
state C, we will have R0 plus R1 on the output of the accumulator now. And that's now, we've enabled the output enable of, the, of that OEA. So that's pushed onto the bus and R0 is set to read with the, with the load pin. So on the next clock cycle in D, R0 holds the value. So that's state A, state B. So notice the controller, our state machine, is just controlling these control signals, all right? It's controlling the routing of information from one place to another through a series of multiplexes, yeah, and, and, and a bus. The data path is the rest of it, if you like, is the actual storage elements, and inputs and outputs. Now, inputs and outputs, okay, where would they come from? Where does this go? Let me give you another example. We've got a block of memory. This will have instructions and data in it. Usually, well, I'll come to that in a minute, packaged together. Memory is asynchronous in general, so um, we usually have these synchronous registers sitting here, data and address. You've got a, another register here called the program counter. That's the address of the next instruction in memory. You've got another register here that holds the current instruction. And this is our state machine, the decoder. We've got an arithmetic logic unit, a very crude one. It's what we had before, right? Nothing special, just does adds. Normally they do multiplies, adds and shifts, at least. All right. So what might we do? We might set the address register here to whatever's in the current program counter. And then it's got some logic to increment itself. All right. So it'll go to the next next address. So whatever address is held in the program counter is now in here. That's now set that up on the next clock cycle to read what's in this memory at that address. On the next one, uh, we will take what pops out of the memory and latch it into the, um, the, the data register. So in that data register will be the next instruction and maybe a bit of data with it, All right? So at this point, at the end of state B, this thing, this register is now holding the next instruction and some data. That's now read into the instruction register on the next clock cycle. All right, that's state C. And then we're in state D. Well, we've got the instruction. We've got the, uh, the data. This state machine can now go and control these little control signals to do whatever you want to do. Moving from register to ALU, ALU back to register, store back to memory. Yeah. Control lines are not shown here and a lot of peripherals are not shown here, but that's it. That is fundamentally what a microprocessor does in its simplest form. This is a single bus microprocessor, I would add. We don't have a separate address bus even. OK. Um, there are much more sophisticated architectures than this. This is the simplest possible one. Right. So. Really, all a microcontroller is, is, is a control and a data path, right? And a few strategic registers placed in the right places to interface with things like memory devices, serial ports, uh, whatever it might be, right? Uh, yeah, this is, as I said before, this is grossly simplified, <laughs> but it would be all right for adding a couple numbers. You might overflow a bit, but um, it would be all right. And um, obviously, there's a lot more that could be hooked onto it. Now, you can get soft core microcontrollers, uh, 8051s, ARM Cortex M0s, etc., etc., that you can actually program into your FPGA. And then you can build your own stuff to hang off the bus. And you can parallel stuff up that a microprocessor can't do. All right. Um, just want to pick up a little detail with that one. So, if you remember, we, we at one point we read this in, this instruction, the next bit of data out of the memory and, and stored it in this register. Well, what you'll get there is a, a number, and if it, it could be an eight bit 
number. So you have an opcode and an operand. So this is the instruction, and this might be an address or some constant data. Often it's the address or register number, right? And um, yeah, it's the opcode that typically gets fed into here, and then the sequence of control signals are then controlled by this state machine here. And it is a sequence. It won't be just be from one, one instruction and it's all done. Multiple clock cycles to execute an instruction. All right. Um, and that's the essence of it, of a microprocessor, right? You could go off and build your own. Should you? Well, if you've got nothing else to do, I suppose. Yeah. If you want to get it out of your system, go ahead. So that, anyway, so a sort of closing point, really. Uh, we saw a bespoke design where I use lots of multiplexers to save on silicon. Um, or we could have paralleled things up a bit and routed things with multiplexers. Bear in mind, when you get 16 bit, 32 bit signals flying around everywhere, that can start taking up a lot of space, irrespective of how many gates you got. You start throwing 32 bit signals around everywhere. And things can get a bit uncomfortable. Um, so sometimes you use a bus. Sometimes you might multiplex signals around. You might re even resort to internal serial communication. Um, there is no absolute rule. It is all a judgment that's the job of the engineer to think strategically and think about, OK, this is the problem. Can we parallel it up? Have we got the space? Maybe some things aren't so time critical, then by all means, sequence them, use a bus. If things are really, really time critical, like high speed cameras, you might want parallel hardware. You can do both. And so that's that's it, really. Um, if I have a closing point, it's that trading off space and speed. So high speed parallel hardware takes more space. All right. So this is a great place to stop. Uh, right. So someone's asked a question and the answer, I, I probably answered it, but I'm going to. Um, this one here. Absolutely. Will it take multiple clock cycles for each instruction? Yes. <laughs> what you don't see when you look at microprocessors for a start, the architecture these days is a lot more sophisticated. There's pipelining. There are multiple buses the duplicates of things so you know there's always this quest to, to make things faster and faster um for but even there you'll still have internally multiple clock cycles to complete an instruction what you often get are multiple decoders and and sequences all right all running one clock cycle out of phase from the next so what's called pipelining so, yes, each instruction will take multiple clock cycles, but you might have eight instructions on the go. And the net throughput, once it's up and running and fully, you know, fully populated, could be one instruction per clock cycle. But each one is eight clock cycles old, if you like. So, yes, there's no way around it. Clocks, um, instructions take quite a lot of time to decode, generating all these control signals and moving stuff around. Um, but you can replicate this. Yeah, you don't just have to have one decoder. These days, nothing uses one decoder, no modern devices. They're all pipeline. They can all execute multiple instructions at the same time, just out of phase with each other. Does that answer that question? So, yeah, every next time Paul Davey mentions pipelining, you know what it means now. Else it say, if they're being decoded ahead of time, how does it deal with jumping? Ha <laughs> ha, great question. Very perceptive question. You know, that's fantastic. It completely screws it up, is the answer. So, yeah. A branch, that's very good. Um, well done, that student. A branch in your code will actually often mess up your pipeline because you don't know where it's going to go. And yeah, you have to start filling it up again. So ARM cleverly made all their instructions, I think it's all, conditional. So you can avoid branches. So for example, if you had an if statement, if x is greater than 2, add 1, else do nothing. So what you do is you you test the condition x is greater than two, and then the add we won't do a branch. The add will only occur on the condition that a certain status bit is set. So what, what I'm getting at there is we can avoid branches by having instructions that only 
actually perform anything if a certain condition is met. But yes, so that that is absolutely right. Yes. So um, if you if you're, if you're decoding multiple things and there are branches, then yes, that does create problems for pipelines. Pipelines uh, get um, have to be flushed. And thanks for coming along and asking questions. Any more questions on this? Um, fire them in by email or put them on the forum. Uh, da, 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 I was going to say one more thing. All these slides are already up. All right. They're already on the module site. They've been there a few days. And the example of the adder uh, is there for you to look at as a reference design. How you partition data, data path and control. OK, I hope that was helpful and useful. Um, I enjoyed doing this one. I thought that was great fun. OK, folks, if you've got no more questions, it's dinner time.